one two one two welcome to the revolution of one live stream what's happening everybody this is tk coleman coming at you live every week at 12 p.m eastern time on tuesdays wednesdays and thursdays on tuesdays and thursdays those are tk's two sets sessions that's where i take two tweets and i give you a couple of thoughts about each tweet to take you beyond what is it I, i've been saying 140 characters but i think it's like 280 whatever it is i take you beyond that I, I give you more than what twitter allows me to give and then on wednesdays the revolution will be live streamed that's when what now come out and i get together to talk about what's going on talk about what we're interested in and how to make the world a freer place in whatever way we can at the individual level today I'm super excited to have Stephen A. Hart. Stephen A. is the host of the Trailblazers FM podcast and the creator of Brand New Academy. And um, today we're going to talk about the logic of Black excellence. Why do Black success stories matter? We're also going to talk about life lessons that Stephen has learned by interviewing hundreds of top creators, achievers, artists, and professionals. And then we're going to kind of talk a little bit about uh, his recent hiatus and some of the things that he's learned by stepping back, slowing down, and, and, and finding the fun and being in the present moment. So I'm, I'm excited to talk about all of that with Stephen A. I know you're going to get me for calling you Stephen A, man, but it's a dream come true. Uh, welcome to the show, brother. <laughs> Appreciate you guys having me, man. It's awesome to be here. Yeah, man, it's, it's good to have you on, brother. Uh, so, you know, I want to dive right in, man, because you and I have very similar missions. I want to give a shout out to Sean Dove from the Campaign for Black Male Achievement because he's the guy that initially connected us. And uh, from the moment we were talking, it was like, man, his brother's right up my alley, you know? Um, so thank you, Sean, for the introduction and all the awesome thank people you, that you brought together. Yeah. But, uh, you know, one question that's come up for me a lot, privately and publicly, by a lot of white friends, white colleagues, and so forth, is why the focus on Black excellence? Why not just excellence? Because anything that yeah. you say about, about excellence or leadership or success, it's useful to everybody. So what's the point of talking about black success stories? Why place that emphasis on race? I wanna, I wanna hear your thoughts on that, man. Most deaf, most deaf. So um, taking this back uh, a bit, TK, um, the inspiration for Trailblazers, I'm a, I'm a dad. I love to say, you know, I'm the best dad ever to two crumb snatchers. You know, we have a 10-year-old a daughter, Layla, um, and my son will actually be six tomorrow, um, Nigel. And Layla was four or five years old, and I'm, I'm up here in Maryland, and I'm, I'm looking around our community. There's so many progressive, amazing black couples that, you know, I've met through, especially through being a parent, you meet other parents in daycare and about the community. And yet every time she was probably like four or five and I'm looking in media at the time, nothing's changed today, but every time you turn on the news, every time you look online, it's something negative. The posturing is defensive for the black community. Yet I'm looking around my own community and I'm seeing a different story be told. I'm seeing the CEO of companies in DC. I'm seeing other close friends of mine elevate to the top ranks of the military, uh, you know, running their own companies. And I'm seeing black success at the highest level, yet no one's telling that story. And so to answer your question, you know, coming back to this defensive posturing, we see our community protesting. We see our community trying to prove our worth, right? And I just think you have so many black folks who are just living out success at the highest level. And it's like, why do we always have to posture defensively? You know, and, and so my whole take on Trailblazers was just to have a platform to showcase that. It's not a conversation about race. It's not a conversation about me having to, to do anything more than to showcase somebody who is passionate about what they're doing you know, highlighting their journey, their failures, um, what they're doing to succeed, their wisdom, their resources, and allowing that to provide fuel to countless others. Because uh, especially amongst entrepreneurs, one of the things I realized in doing research uh, leading into the podcast too, was that a big reason black entrepreneurs were failing 
was they didn't have enough other black successful entrepreneurs pouring into them. So I was like, well, this could also double over as a source of digital mentors to help other people on the come up, as our brother Shandov would say, giving them the mission fuel that they need to be able to thrive. And so why black excellence? Man, there's 10 million other podcasts, which I love, right? I'm a, I'm a product of Pat Flynn and Lewis Howes and John Lee Dumas back in the day when I was listening as a podcast consumer. But those brothers, they're, they're not showcasing on a day-to-day -day basis black success. And so I was like, you know what? As a marketer, this is my niche, right? This is the area I want to focus on and, you know, give, turn up the volume on, right? And allow that yeah. to, to be a platform that people can come to week in and week out and, um, and be able to hear, you know, the wisdom of, of entrepreneurs, leaders, creatives, authors, whatever they are whatever industry, whatever profession, showcasing that and, and giving that giving that a big up. What, what oh, I kind of like about that is, what I kind of like about that is, you know, in sports, you hear a lot of this theory, like if you're trying to win the game, the best offense or the best defense is a good offense. The people who yeah. win the games are the people who are going to put up the points. And so I really like your take of, of switching from you know a defensive mindset where you're always trying to safeguard, you're always trying to defend, you're always trying to justify you know this this notion of excellence, and then flipping it on its head and saying no, um, I'm going to play offense. I'm going to showcase all of the excellence uh, of people who you know fit in this spectrum um, to you know to elevate the community. Uh, therefore you know to contribute to a better offensive standing to a better uh pro pro progression and a, a winning mentality yeah yeah and, you know it's interesting we'll talk a bit about my my silent period but the podcast was launched on february 1st of 2016. up until january i think january 6th of this year I'd never, and this is an indie podcast. I don't have a backbone. The Campaign for Black Male Achievement was our sponsor for three years. Um, beyond Sean, you know, and, and CBME, this is an indie podcast. I have a producer who helps me cut the episodes, but I'm the everything man, right? And I work a full-time job. Uh, so a lot of people think, hey, you know, this is something I'm doing full-time. I'm Jamaican, I have like 17 jobs, right? But this is what I do when the crumb snappers are asleep at night, right? And, um, and you know, for, for so many years, for four years, I put out an episode every Monday morning at 5 a.m. religiously, right? Like, without wow. fail. I could be at a work event, you know, I have memories of being at, you know, trade shows. I'm a marketer running a trade show in San Diego, coming in Sunday night at 10 p.m., have no episode cut for, for Monday. This is before I even had a producer. And coming in and literally, you know, getting a cup of coffee and sitting up till literally 5 a.m., hitting publish, you know. And I had to do that a couple of times. There are a couple instances of that happening, you know, where I'm cutting into the night and tech, tech goes down, you know. And episode that starts over, you know, but I'm proud of being able to be reliable, being able to be consistent um, over that period of time for four years, you know, putting out 205 weekly consecutive episodes of the podcast um, is, is something, you know, I was proud of, really proud of. Man. That, that consistency, man, I, I was just writing about this idea the other day, how we tend to overestimate the value of being seen and we underestimate the value of showing up. But but it's in that consistency, man, showing up in season and out of season, even even if people would let you off the hook for, for being absent, even if people yeah. don't even know what you went through to get there. It's like that's where the personal growth comes in man. that's where the personal power comes from, like. Like, like Matt, respect for that, brother. Matt, respect. You know, a lot you know, of content creators might be listening to this. Um, and this is a, a wisdom nugget. The second year, the, the first year we grew, 
And there was probably midway into the second year where there was a six month stretch from like the summer, almost into the, the, the beginning of the, the next year where week after week, the downloads started to decline. Right. Mm. And we mm. don't talk about that, right? Like you're continuing <laughs> to produce, but the thing isn't growing. Right. The thing isn't growing. It's a year and a half to the two year mark. And I just continue to put out the content what, through the doubts, through the concerns, right? And what happened, we got to our second birthday, February of 2018. Two weeks after our second birthday, Apple gave us our first homepage feature, put a banner up on the homepage of Apple, giving us love nice. in Black history. And we literally saw like a 5X bump in downloads and it leveled off to like three times the subscribers. And, you know, and from that point on, the podcast started to grow. So as content creators, you know, it's one thing to be like, yo, it's consistent. But truth be told, there are periods in there that sucked, you know, that you just weren't seeing progress. And, you know, lots of people are like, man, I need to grow my podcast. I need to grow my vlog, whatever it is you're trying to, and if it doesn't happen in a month, two, you're like, oh, this is failing. When in truth, you just need to remain consistent over that period of time, you know, and um, and and be patient with it. Hey, man, pre preach that, brother. And, and, and consistency for you lasted like almost two years. Yeah. You know? um, I remember, I think it was maybe about six years ago now, I did a personal development project where I said, I'm going to I'm going to show up and I'm going to blog you know, every day for a year. And I remember, you know, there, were, there would be these moments where like you, I'd be traveling or I get home late and I'm at home for the holidays and I'm stressing out about getting my blog post up. And I had a, a family member say, do you even get paid for these? Like, like he's wondering why I'm like pushing myself to write a blog post. Like, is somebody making you do this? And I'm like, no, I'm not getting paid. Nobody's making me do it, but I believe in the power of showing up. And I think for my first year, my dad was a subscriber and I may have had like a few people that, that yeah. read my blog, but the majority of people were friends that I would send my blog post to and they would hurt my feelings by not reading it at all, you know? And, and it wasn't until about a year and a half, two years of blogging every day that, I, that people started to share on social media. And then people started to reach out and say, hey, I read this blog post. Would you mind coming to give a talk about this topic at this place? And you start to see things gradually begin to build, but it's so easy when you're in that building mode to convince yourself that I'm doing everything wrong. Uh, nobody needs what I have to offer. Uh, it's all pointless because we, we're in this kind of like microwave instant result culture. And if we don't have something that goes viral overnight, we just think we're, we're losing, you know? Yeah. You and I are big sports fans. I remember watching a clip back on, I, I think, the very first episode of ESPN Sports Center, and it came off the air, and they didn't even know if anybody was watching it, you know? <laughs> and you think something like Sports Center that is on like 24 7 today, right? Like they could have easily summed that up a failure in the early stages of it. And I think, you know, we are media players in the early, just like that, but you have to remain consistent through the the tough patch and, and those silent years, you know, to, to be able to get it to have traction. And it's a beautiful thing. Podcasting and a lot of modern day media, you don't know who's on the other side. It's hard to quantify how many people are watching a video or, or listening to you on a podcast because it's not centralized to any one hub. Uh, and in, in this quiet season, there's so many people who have reached out like, hey, when are you coming back out with a podcast that I don't know that they were ever listening, but they've yeah, now yeah. raised their hand and they'll reach out on the website contact page and be like, yo, you know what you've been putting out means something that we, we need to hear you. And it's interesting in this season of everything else happening right now that, you know, a lot of people have been looking for our content because of the very thing we we're talking about before. They're looking for that positive um, output that has nothing to do with, you know, all that is is weighing on us right now um, on the other side. Stephen, I wanted to know if you would share with our audience 
uh, the importance of niching down. I know that's something that you just kind of talked about earlier and, and you found your place to contribute and you found what, what mattered to you. But could you talk a little bit more about that process and why it's important? Absolutely. I love to say that, you know, if you focus on everyone, then you're serving no one in particular. Uh, as, a, as a marketer, you really have to, we think about Facebook. Facebook didn't just have two, three billion people on their platform. Mark started at Harvard, not just at Harvard, but in the most elite fraternity in Harvard, right? And built out, jumped up and down in a puddle, and then slowly expanded to where it became an ocean. We have finite resources. So as, as content creators, as marketers, as entrepreneurs and leaders, it's so much easier to define a specific group of people you want to serve initially, and then over time expand out from there. There are a couple of things that happen when you do that too. It's much easier for you to, from a messaging standpoint, what you're communicating, it's easier for me to be like, hey, I'm speaking to TK. TK and I are both you know, black men, early 40s, right? Like we have a lot more that I can write a message that is speaking specifically to TK. But if I'm trying to serve everyone, then that message mm -hmm. might also be approaching my mom. And the way I speak to my mom and the way I speak to TK is two different messages entirely. So the benefits of niching down, there, there's so many benefits to that. But one, you're directing resources, um, a bit you know, more targeted direction of your resources, money and time. And your message speaks to a specific someone and creates that connection. And as I begin to, you know, so I'm serving black leaders and entrepreneurs primarily. I, and the term avatar might not stick with everyone, but that's, you know, the, 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 the perfect person, the ideal person, consumer of your content in this case, uh, for trailblazers, as each of these people raise their hand, I'm like, yo, um, do you mind, you know, we jump into DMs, have a chat. Can I pick up the phone and call you? I'm mentally, right, able to start having a direct conversation with different black leaders, different black entrepreneurs, different black creatives, understanding exactly where they are, what they're trying to do, what's making them tick, what's keeping them up at night, right? That begins to inform when I'm in a conversation with a potential guest and I'm, I'm listening to somebody say, yo, you know, um, I serve, uh, you know, leaders and they're touching on a topic that let's say Sean Dove, who's a leader, right? Um, has shared with me a specific problem he's working through that's keeping him up at night. Now I'm no longer Stephen A. Hart, the host. I'm now sitting in the seat of Sean and I'm like, yo, you know what? My listener has this problem, right? And I'm able to speak to that guest now from the vantage point of Sean. And by doing that, I'm serving all the other black leaders that have a very similar problem. Th that comes by you yeah. defining your niche and knowing who you're serving, right? Many avatars begin to form an audience, right? Because you don't go to a concert and say 1,000 uh, Kamau's in the audience, right? There are 1,000 people who happen to like the person on the stage. And so as you begin to understand the different avatars in your audience, you begin to understand your audience as a whole, that niche, and you begin to serve them what they want. So that's my take on, you know, why niching down? And then from the monetary standpoint, because it all comes back to money, me saying, hey, I serve black leaders and entrepreneurs. I've got at least five times less downloads than several of my peers who launched podcasts about the same point in time as me. Several of them have 10x my downloads. They don't have the money that I've got so far from the podcast because they're serving too broad an audience. By me being very clear on who I'm serving, I've been able to command sponsorship money. I've been able to create products. I've been able to do different things that has been very clear to the people that want to partner with me exactly who I'm speaking to. So it also helps you on the monitor, say.
You know, man, this is really relevant to a lot of the fear and nervousness that people are having right now. You know, um, you know, I was talking the other day about how if 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 your brand has you constantly anxious and worried about, you know, who's going to be mad at you for what you post on social media, then you're not building a brand. You're building a box. You're, you're mm -hmm. building something that's restricting you and creating more fear than inspiration in your life. And so many people are. I don't know what to say. I'm afraid to talk because I'm going to get pushed back. But when you know who you're talking to, you also get to know who you ignore, right? Be yeah. Because in the same way that you're here to serve everybody, you're also not here to placate everybody. You're also not here to appease everybody. And, and that's what, that's that mental health component, right? Where you can go online and you can say, no matter what I create, I'm going to get some pushback. Somebody's going to be mad at me. Somebody's going to disagree with me. Somebody's going to say I'm wrong. But I know who I'm talking to, and so I can prioritize the constructive criticism I get from the audience that I'm serving, not the people that don't resonate with the problems I'm trying to solve. You know, I really love yes. that, man. Yeah, you have to be able to own who you're serving and be okay repelling everyone else, right? And it and it serves you best because you're gonna have the trolls as you begin to grow, right? You're gonna have people trolling you and complaining and you know, oh, I don't like this. That's fine. When you know who you're serving, I'm a Christian brother. So I have no problem talking about, you know, my relationship with God in a podcast. If it comes up, it's not something that I'm speaking to necessarily in the content, but I know 90% of my, my listeners are also Christians, right? So I, I know who I'm serving. If that's not you, that's cool, right? You, you can choose not to listen to the episode or not to listen to the podcast as a whole, but I, you're, I'm comfortable in my skin with whatever comes up in the podcast because i know who i'm speaking to and i know what i'm trying to put out yeah and you got somebody that's like well i don't like you bringing up jesus i'm not a believer like hey man like i'm not apologizing to you for it like there are plenty of people out there that's not talking about jesus you have the freedom to go listen to them but this exactly. is what i'm here to represent I, I love that man you know speaking of solving problems and knowing your audience I want to go back to something you said earlier that I thought was particularly inspiring. You said what what motivated you to start this podcast is you were noticing this this difference between what you're seeing in the media in terms of how black people are being presented and what you're seeing in your actual lived communities in terms of what black people are doing. And, and I think something that a lot of people are having a hard time making a distinction between nowadays is is the light and the spotlight. Right? When Jesus says, let your light shine, he's talking about your gifts and your talents. The spotlight, that's what mainstream media is going to find interesting. And right now, there are a lot of people who are shining their light in our communities. Mainstream media says, well, that's not trendy. That's not interesting. That's not going to sell papers. And they ignore that and they focus on one thing. And so you got a lot of people that they're asking questions like, oh, well, where are all the black people when black folks kill other black people? Where are all the black people when this happens? And it's like, yo, we're out there, man. We're out there working, having conversations, trying to solve these problems. Like, it is not the case that just because CNN doesn't come to those meetings and gatherings that they're not happening. And I, and I love that what you're doing is you're providing an alternative where, where you're shining a spotlight on the awesome work that we're building, even if the media ain't, you know, interested in, in talking about that right now. I think we need that. Everybody does. Yeah. I mean, there's so many success stories that I I was not informed on before somebody else introduced me to them, right? Uh, I mean, there are people who everybody should know in the black community, right? And when I tell people will be like, well, who have you had on your podcast, right? And they're looking for me to be like LeBron James, Oprah Winfrey, right? And I bring up Dr. Dennis Kimbrough, I bring up Janice Bryant Holroyd, and they're like, who's that? And I'm like, you should absolutely know who these people are. And people don't. And, and you know, coming back to it, you know, my daughter was the fuel for a lot of what, you know, I created. I wanted this platform to showcase people who look like her, sound like her, who are accomplishing things, not necessarily knocking athletes and, and musicians and celebrities, but I wanted to go beyond that being her bubble, right? And and yeah. so it was it was the fuel for saying, hey, you know what? There's so much happening in your world with people who look like you and providing that representation 
for her to know that she can do it because somebody else looking like her has done it and did it through, you know, much more obstacles than, than she will have to in her time. But yeah, enough, enough, enough cases of, 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 you know, success that, that mainstream media is just not given that spotlight. So. Yeah. You know, you know, to me, that's the answer right there. Why, why do black success stories matter? Um, I, I, I think something that, that people who are very like ideological and philosophical overlook is that human beings aren't propositional. We don't respond to you just giving us philosophical statements about how we should live and how we should think. We respond to stories, you know? We respond to stories of people who are from the places that we're from. Stories of people who had similar weaknesses and strengths as us, similar obstacles to overcome as us. And when those people do it and we hear stories about that, that has a much bigger impact on our imagination than just you should work harder. You know, you should believe in yourself. You, you should get after it. I mean, that makes us feel guilty because we know we ought to be doing better, but we don't really know how to manufacture the inspiration and how to be consistent. But when you have a story that seizes the imagination and that captures the heart, it makes you say, whoa, I can do this. And, and, and I think for a lot of our white counterparts, or a lot of our white peers, colleagues, when you turn on the TV, you look at billboards, you are always seeing someone who looks like you that's succeeding in some area of life. And so it just kind of fades to the background as this thing that's taken for granted. But when you work with young black children, you see how powerful it is for them, how much the truth comes alive for them when you tell them the story of a black millionaire that went out and did it. Like their eyes light up in a different way than if you just tell them a colorblind story so to speak. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Bridget, there's that's so, that's so powerful because, and this goes beyond color. A story is as old as time and it doesn't burn calories to consume a good story, right? We tell our, our kids bedtime stories, right? It's the easiest thing to consume and make sense of versus you trying to bombard them with something that's too heavy, right? We can all consume a good story, consume a good character, understand who the villain is, understand the good and the bad and how things play out. That's easy. That's easy for our mind to absorb. And we actually, in all the noise happening right now, we want a good story so we don't have to burn calories, right? With everything else that's, that's burning our brain all day long. And, and yeah, I mean, white people are doing it too, right? They tell the stories, but they tell the stories about they're their their own. And so this is this is no different. This is just me focusing in or spotlights on 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 this specific niche. I think what I also like about it is that you're serving a problem that you know that you're like your child is gonna have, where there's a lack of resources. And I think um I, I think it just motivates you a little bit different, right? Because you you understand that uh this is something that, you know, maybe as a parent, I'm struggling to have these conversations um, because there's not a lot of great races for, for resources for me to pull. I think, you know, even for myself, when um, I'm looking, when, when, when I've tried to break into certain industries or I've tried to, to take my career in certain ways, and I just feel there's a lack of resources for people who look like me, who are trying to do the same thing, who have, tra who have already trailblazed that same path. And I think the stories just aren't being told. And so it's really cool to hear that the reason that you're doing this um, is because, in fact, you know, contrary to popular uh, belief, these stories have actually happened. People actually have broke through this mold. Um, we just don't hear about it as much. And 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 I just and I think that's powerful because whenever you can serve um, a place, you know, a market demand. And, and a lot of times that might just start with you. That might just start with a demand that you want from the market, something that a service that you would like to see happen. And, and it just motivates you to a different degree when, when you're really actually trying to solve a problem and you're not just creating something um, for the sake of whatever. And that's a great place to be. Uh, sometimes if you don't know who your avatar is, you're, you're trying to start an idea, but you don't know who that audience is that you're serving. 
if you're served by the product you're creating, you can look at your own challenges and obstacles and serve you and then begin to go out from there. That worked for me trying to serve my daughter. And in turn, what ended up happening was so many people around me were like, yo, I need this right now. Like you're trying to serve your daughter 15 years out from now, but like I needed this content right now. And then it, 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 you begin to realize like, hey, you know what? It's not just a puddle. There's a lake right here, right? That I can, of, of people of all different ages, and and backgrounds that can be served so yeah you know it 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 started internally me trying to solve a problem as a parent um and a professional uh i'm again coming back to being a jamaican and always having you know several titles i'm employed but i'm always an entrepreneur i'm a brand strategist and the podcast uh you know and um and so that also provided fuel for me saying hey you know i don't want to just focus this on corporate professionals and leaders. I don't want to just focus this on entrepreneurs. I want to serve the spectrum uh, of, of people, you know, across different industries and, and, and job titles. Hey man, let, let's talk about some of the, the life lessons you've learned from, from past interviews you've conducted. I mean, you, you've talked with so many people of so many different, you know, professions and so forth. I, I love for you to break down for our, our listeners, maybe, uh, a few life lessons that that stick out for you from some of your favorite interviews. Yeah, man, how much time will I have left? <laughs> uh, <laughs> man, um, you know, interviewing over 150 plus people, it's been amazing to to just digest and process, you know, some of what you hear. And, um, you know, the, the beautiful thing is that black success is not mono. It's not, you know, it, it, it doesn't just come in one form, right? You have people who come from various different backgrounds. Uh, some people have had successful parents and, and a lineage, you know, legacy of, of success happening in their family and others, you know, have come from really bad, you know, backgrounds, right? Um, no parents. Um, struggling. And um, I think to there's one of my all time favorite episodes is from an entrepreneur, uh, a black lady down in Nashville, Tennessee, Mignon Francois of the Cupcake Collection. And mm. Mignon's story is, is probably hands down the most engaging podcast episode I'd ever conducted. And I was sitting right here in this room and and I, this is a woman i saw her i saw her in a short video online and immediately messaged her on instagram and i was like i don't know your backstory literally heard like a minute clip i need you on the podcast and so the first time we had a conversation i'm turning on the video and i kid you tk I kid you not tk within five minutes i'm looking up i'm like crying right like i mean this ladies and I just knew this was going to be the episode that just had listeners. I'm, I published an episode at 5 a.m. By 7 a.m., I had people messaging me in every DM on every social platform, jumping up and down in buses, on trains, in their commutes. Mind blown. <laughs> the woman who literally had everything fall apart. She's down to her last $5. The light is mm. off in her house. Cars repoed. She had $5 and she's like listening to somebody telling her she can start a business and she has a decision to make. She can choose to feed her kids or she can use this $5 to, to try and turn something. $5. She goes to somebody comes to her door and says, Hey, you know, I need like 600 cupcakes a week from now. And she comes back in her house and she says, God, like, why would you do this to me? I have $5 to my name. And here's this order for, you know, products. And I don't even have the resources to fill this order. She literally walks to the corner store and buys all she can with $5. She turns the $5 into 60 the next day, 60 into the however many cupcakes she needed the following weekend. And she goes on to build a business that's turned over over $10 million at this point. Um, from that five dollars 
right? And it, it, I get the chills every time. I mean, like that whole podcast is just filled with just gems of, of knowledge all over it. But man, if, if that, if that doesn't, you know, just confirm that you no matter how low, right? How dark you feel like your situation is, um, you can still find a way forward and out of, you know, uh, that dark hole that you're in. And, and um, I, I listen, I've listened to that episode so much and I'd, I'd highly encourage anyone to, you know, consume some of, of that content, right? Because it, it was, it was such a powerful episode. Um, another one like that would be, you know, Eric Thomas, so many people know ET, the hip hop preacher. Um, but Dr. Eric Thomas is somebody who back in 2010, I had a field, this is a past life and story, but you know, I ran a trading advisory back in 2005 to 2008, well, till 2011, but 2008, of course the financial crisis hits. And I was, my whole goal in life was to be a millionaire by the time I was 30. And um, I get to 30 years and like 10 months, my accountant's like, yeah, your, you know, your net worth is beyond your goal, right? So I'm a millionaire um, and, um, you know, we're, we're, we're sitting nice. Um, we get into 2000, I, I get married on June 28th of 2008. And I have just a stupid, you know, six figure wedding in Otrias in Jamaica, leave Jamaica and go to Tahiti for a cruise for my honeymoon. And the gap of the, the wedding and our honeymoon, the business collapsed. This is pre-financial crisis of one of the larger investments we had made, had a made off story of its own, right? hundred million dollar fund just went up in smoke. And it, it basically blew us up, right? Had to blow up our fund. Um, and I found myself $7 million in the hole going, and I'm, I have a cruise, right? Three weeks after a wedding, I have a cruise for my honeymoon. And so the, the whole thing blows up, right? And, um, and this is a whole different story than where I was going with it. But the, the fund blows up and I have a $15,000 cruise. I can't kill the cruise. That's, you know, you just can't. And it's my honeymoon. So I literally go to the doctor and I'm on depression meds, right? Like I am trying to keep myself out of jail at this point, right? I have investors wanting their money, all this mess, right? And I'm on depression meds, dude, on, on you know, a cruise on my honeymoon. And I found myself for a year and a half after that, rebuilding this business, we had to dissolve everything, rebuild the entire structure. We eventually rebuilt the business, but you know, um, and I shared this story in the podcast, but you know, it, it was my darkest, darkest Valley ever. Right. I go from telling my wife, I'm gonna buy her a brownstone, a million dollar brownstone to like, yo, you got to pay the rent and I have no idea when I'm ever going to have a paycheck again. Right. And I go like a year and a half of no income working 18 hour days, seven days a week, trying to rebuild this business. And in that gap, you know, I'm searching for anything like, you know, I, I, I spiritually grew in that season. Um, and I'm looking for people who could just pour into me, right. Anything positive. Cause I'm, my business partner is like, you know, borderline suicidal, like we were borderline just dead, right? Like everything that you processed as the, you know, the, the, the pinnacle, right? Like what you were striving for your goals, they're all material and it all mm -hmm. came apart. Right. And, and so you don't have clear direction on what your life purpose is at this point. Right. And you're just going trying to survive. And I have a new bride who I'm now moving from the pride of having all this coin to having to rely on a new bride to, to carry me, right? And um, wow. in the season, one of the people who I literally would listen to their mixtapes back in, you know, back in the day is Dr. Eric Thomas. At the time, he didn't even have his PhD yet. But ET would put out these mixtapes, right? Um, 
it, it, you know, if you want to succeed as bad as you want to breathe, um, is, is Eric Thomas, right? Famous viral video, but ET goes from, you know, the story of, of being homeless, living in abandoned buildings, taking 12 years to get a four-year degree, right? Goes on to become the, the world's biggest and best motivational speaker out there today. And ET, I literally would be, you know, trying to hustle my way out of this dark valley. And I would hit ET's mixtape, man. I'd be listening to this thing on repeat, like all day, every day. <clears throat> Last summer, I literally get off a stage um, at Podcast Movement and I look at my cell phone and there's an email from ET's team. Like he wants to come on the podcast. And it was such a full circle moment for me that, you know, I, ET was on my list of people I want to have on the podcast, but I'm like, I'm not there yet, right? I'm not yet at ET's level to even reach out to his people because Trailblazer still has a way to go. And, you know, the lesson in that season, I come full circle, long story. But, you know, it's, it's like, man, sometimes, one, ET was just amazing, right? Like, this is my... This is sort of my hall of fame, you know, of guests. Um, but, you know, like I almost broke down crying, like fanboy, you know, he shows up on the video and I'm like, mind blown, right? Um, but lesson for me was that sometimes, you, you know, you, you have to pat yourself on the shoulder as you're talking about the blog earlier, right? And and you're doing it for your dad and you're doing it for your friends and sometimes you're doing it for no one. But there are many of those dark days where I'm just like, all right, I'm doing this podcast, you know, and some people are listening, I know that, you know, I'm seeing the downloads, I don't know who they are. And one day I, I hope to get to a point where, you know, some of the people I aspire to talk to will want to have that conversation with me. and. I was not prepared for them reaching out to me first. And sometimes you have to acknowledge that, you know, you're, you're more than enough, right? And, and you are doing enough um, and that you are, you are ready. You, you have that worth um, to, to what you're building. So, you know, sometimes you have to just do your best and, you know, just believe and, and trust the process that, you know, the right things and the right people will come to you in some cases. Um, and, you know, there, there, there's so many other stories. Minda Hartz is, is another uh, dear, close friend of mine who is also a connect of, of Sean Dove. Um, Minda has been on the podcast several times, but Minda is a, a, a dear friend who, you know, launched her book a year ago. And probably a year and a half ago, I'm looking at Minda and I'm like, as a marketing guy, Minda's website wasn't ready for a book launch at the time. And uh, she didn't have all the resources at the time. You know, she's trying to like prepare herself for this book launch. And I'm like, Minda, I'm going to just pour into you. You know, I don't have, you know, all of it, but what I do have, let me just help you sort out some things. And I just saw what she was putting together with her book. And I'm like, yo, you are going to have a bestseller. Like, I just see it. And I saw it as a slow groundswell. And this is somebody who authored the memo, what women of color need to know to secure a seat at the table. And Minda went out to, you know, um, agencies, uh, different book, book agencies and said, hey, you know, this is a book I want to write for women of color in the workplace. And so many people are like, no, they don't need that book. Like, there's nobody that wants that book right now. And the more I'm looking at her, I'm like, Minda, you have not... Not only do you have to write the book, right? You have to get this book out there. This book is needed. Women of color want this. And it's gonna be a groundswell, like tipping point, right? Of Malcolm Gladwell. I just saw that happening over time. And Minda went ahead, wrote the book um, that no one would ever want. And not only does it go on to be a bestseller, Minda probably is building one of the dopest, most engaging communities for women of color right now across any social platform. And, you know, just watching her rise right now in front of me is just amazing, you know, to see and, and, um, and just, you know, and these stories I'm telling you, man, I mean, you know, whether it's from Minyan or Minda or Sean Dove, right? Um, these aren't people that 
the mainstream media is putting out on on any channel that you're you're watching right but um they are are living out their life's passion um in, in doing work that they're they're truly um loving and and find value in and um you know in minda's case i mean she has provided so much fuel to to women in the workplace and got so raw in a book um that you know she could only get to that point not working in the in the workplace anymore right but able to speak what so many other women are feeling um in a way that was just real and raw and and, and to the point um and now every tech company every social media platform is wanting mindo especially in this season to come in and to speak to their communities right so we go from you know no one wants your book to everyone wants mindo um and now has you know gotten approved for the second and the third book um about what she's what her platform is 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 built around and and um and so amazing man i mean there's so many lessons to unpack from from some of these stories but and and the beautiful thing is it's not like it's a story of the past this isn't history this is dynamic you're watching them even still after you tell a story you're watching this thing continue to you know blossom and, and so you know people like Minda have had back you know uh, two and three times on the podcast Sean has been back um and so many people you know that you kind of want to continue to watch the story unfold um and you know Janice Bryant Holroyd I touched on her earlier um if you don't know who Janice Bryant Holroyd is shame on you shame on me I didn't know who she was in in January 2018. Janice Bryant Holroyd is the first black woman to build and grow a billion dollar company in this country um before Oprah right um and built a staffing agency from herself in in um you know just by herself in in a in a small office in California to now being in you know a, a multi-global you know massive corporation of tens of thousands of people and um a woman who's probably my mom my mom and dad's age at this point but just a wealth of wisdom and passion you know that you know that old black person energy that will tell you the stories that just <laughs> fire up, right? Um, that's Janice Bryant Hallright. Um, you know, from a family, I'm from a big family, right? My dad is one of 12 kids. My mom is one of seven. I got like 50 first cousins on my dad's side alone. And this is a woman of that same kind of, you know, big family, um, somebody you can relate to as like an auntie, right? And, and you know, just built from the ground up and and just had the passion and the belief and the determination all of these stories right it, it's it's stories of determination um where in many cases they built through no one believing in them they built through not having all the the answers all the wisdom they built through tremendous failures which i love to dive into in these stories by the way because i find that you know the 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 underbelly of a trailblazer episode is always one where i start from a place of gratitude we talk about their backstory we talk about what they're doing but i love to get into the failure and and that that valley moment because oftentimes when i tell you janice bryant holroyd is you know um the the richest black you know the, the black one of the richest black women on the on the planet you're like uh eh, can't get there so why should i listen but you know when when you dive in and you hear Minda's failure, you hear Mignon's failure. Mignon knows she has a ten million dollar business, but she was once in her in her house with the lights turned off, cars repoed, and somebody listening to the podcast can oftentimes relate to that right now, and be like, "Yo, my lights are off right now. I don't know. You know, I don't have a job in the middle of COVID. I got you know I'm unemployed." Um, and I don't have the answers for tomorrow. And you listen to Minion's story and you're like, well, wow, you know, maybe it's possible. Maybe there is hope for me. And um, and so I love diving into the the failures of somebody's story and allowing them from that point to 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 share the wisdom and and that mission feel 
on on what they you know did coming out of that um, that got them to where they are at the peak now. So and then pouring into the resources and and the wisdom. So every story that I tell, that's a framework that that story kind of falls on. Um, but you know the the last one I'll share is is Art Steel. And it's an episode, I, I want to say it's episode 103 of the podcast, but it, it's probably one of the most important episodes I had done because she talks about estate planning and the importance of the black community, especially no matter whether you're single or you're married or you have kids or not. She talked about the importance of having a will, of having insurance, of having an estate plan. Um, and, and what that means to us narrowing the gap, um, the wealth gap um, in, in, in our community um, and, and really kind of breaking it down. Because at that point, I had an estate plan and I didn't know what I had. I just knew we did what we needed to do to make sure our kids would be good should one of us or both of us drop out at the same time. Um, but art broke down the importance of that in a way that, you know, didn't burn the calories, right? It was an easy story to consume and make sense of. And the reason I said that was one of the most important stories, there's so many listeners who reached out to me after, didn't have a will, didn't have an estate plan, sought assistance to, you know, to figure out, well, who can I contact? You know, we help them get access to lawyers and, and the right people. And because of that episode, there are several people I know personally who took the time to get an insurance policy, to get a will in place and, and provide, you know, their, their kids a future should something happen to them. And so the benefit of that episode to me outlived me and the podcast, right? Mm -hmm. Because generations from now, they'll never know that their great grandparents you know, listen to an episode of Art Steel and because they left an inheritance, right? The future generations closed the gap and had a better tomorrow. And so, you know, that was to me one of one of the powerful stories of the podcast that, you know, no one knows who Art Steel is. Or not, you know, in the mainstream context of things. But she shared a message that, you know, was was so needed. Um because you have, um, you know, there's a study done in 2017 that said, hey, you know, if we do nothing, if the black community does nothing, median black household income is trending to zero, zero wealth by the year 2053. Um, zero. And so that was my way of saying, you know, each year I'm starting off the podcast, the first six episodes of every year. And we've done, I think, two or three wealth series at this point where, you know, we focused on having guests that could speak to the wealth gap and not financial advisors. Right. But people who are in different sides of that wealth conversation that could kind of speak to helping us frame a different mindset and doing the things that we need to do. Um, so I, I've been gabbing a, a, a long time. I'll pause there. <laughs> Well, look, I got to jump in because I know TK is jumping at, or chomping at the bit. There is so much to unpack. Um, so I got to selfishly jump in and just ask you, as you just transitioned us from, you know, all these amazing conversations about um, failures, about success, about inspiring people that the mainstream has never talked about. And you transi transitioned us to talking about the wealth gap. I... I you know, in this time that we have left, I really want you to share what was it like being seven million dollars in the hole? I think a lot of black people can't relate to, you know, having a million dollars or to having um, two million, 10 million, millions of dollars, even hundreds of thousands of dollars. But a lot of a lot of black folks can relate to being in debt. But I don't know about that level of debt. So please just just walk through yeah. what that experience was like being in such a low, low place. It was dark and lonely and, you know, humbling um, is not even um, a word to describe that. Um, to, to be clear, you know, or we, I was running a, a fund and the fund lost $7 million, but I still found myself because I'm running a business. 
I had leveraged a lot of debts in, in the, you know, where I wasn't clearing my debts because I had the assets. So the assets left and I was left with the debts. I was personally left in six figures of debts. Compound this, um, this was also, again, in the heights of the financial crisis. So I had real estates, I had a, you know, property that I, I, I still had debts I was holding on to. And in addition, the, the assets I still had went upside down because all my real estates took a nosedive, right? When the real estate, you know, tanked. So I had, you know, home in Florida that went from like being worth almost 300 grand to being worth less than a hundred, right? And I'm upside down now on a mortgage. And it was just, it was, it was so, I, I don't know how to describe how dark a season that was. Um, and that was, that was a time where spiritually I grew more in the, the year, the 12 to 18 months following that than my entire life. Right. Um, Jeremiah 29, 11 was something that just, just, you know, I lived on, <laughs> I was eating, you know, um, the words of just trying to, to believe that there was a hope and a future for me, um, coming out of it. Um, to speak to debt, uh, to, to, to that level of debt. And, and again, um, I was in a new marriage. Most marriages fail in the first five years because of finances. I found myself three weeks into a marriage telling my wife I was in six figures of debt. And, and uh, actually, that's not correct. I told her I was in debt. I didn't tell her just how much personal debt I was in for probably a year and a half um, when she was married and she realized, I was upside down as much as I was on the real estate side of things. It was the the latter part of, you know, like a, a, a bit over a year in that we realized like, hey, you know what? From a marriage standpoint, if we were going to do this, we had to do it together. And we, she brought home Dave Ramsey, Financial Peace University. And I'm like, I'm running a financial fund. You're bringing me Dave Ramsey? She's like, look. You know, if we're going to do this together over the long term, right, we have to get our financial mindset in the same place and we have to move through this debt together. And, you know, from that point forward, we started to live as humble as I'll get out, man. I mean, it was it was a miserable three, four years of, you know, budgeting every last dollar, you know, not going out to eat not buying extra anything. It, it was a reframe of our entire way of thinking about money to the point where it's now just the way we think about money. So, you know, I've lived in my house eight years this month. And, you know, if we have to change a car, we drive our cars till they, they break. You know, we're not changing out a car every three, four years, right? Drive them till they hit 150,000 miles or whatever. Uh, we've lived in the same house for eight years. Um, we could afford a much bigger home today, but we're just comfortable, right? Um, and and it's just this mindset towards you know what? Let's save. Let's let's save towards college. Let's save towards retirement. Let's let's start to take approach that you know what we're going to be in a situation where you know um, Dave Ramsey always says today you have to live like no one else, so tomorrow you can live like no one else. Um, and, and we embrace that mindset. And um, I'm in so much better of a place today. I have no debt. You know, I owe nobody anything. You know, my car is paid off. My car is free and clear. I owe a mortgage on this house. And that's it. But, you know, we pay off our credit cards every month. We don't have, you know, I'm able to, you know, maximize my investment in a 401k month to month. Um, and, you know, it, it was just a change of mindset to be like, yo, you know what? We're cash poor still to, to, to this day, even though we're earning so much more. But it's because we just learned how to to handle money in a way where instead of when we get a pay increase, we run out and buy something. We just steadily increased what we were contributing to savings. We we're contributing to our kids' savings. So we just operated on the same money that we'd always been operating on, you know, with a mindset that there's going to come a day where... You know, we're in our mid fifties and we have an option on whether or not we want to retire or we want to do whatever we want to do. But it just, it, that, that season, if, if nothing else, it reframed over years, over the long term. it wasn't a quick fix, but it reframed my mindset towards how I looked at money. 
Well, man, I'm going to use a sports analogy for how I feel as I listen to you talk about this. So um, I'm from Chicago, University of Illinois basketball team. You remember Darren Williams. Um, that was the team he played for. They were, I believe, 40 and one that season. They, they were the number one ranked college team and were just so dominant. Like they had like four three-point shooters and would, and would be lights out everybody every night, dominating everybody by 20 points. And I remember there in, in the in the uh, final four, they had a game against Arizona and they were down by like about 18 with like three minutes left in the game. And if you're living in Chicago watching this, you're just stunned. It's like we've dominated all year long and they're dominating us. And then just slowly but surely, Darren Williams hit a three, Luther Head hit a three, D Brown gets a steal, drops a layup. And it's like, okay, we're down by 14, but it's still like a minute and a half. Darren Williams hits a three, turnover, get a steal, layup, loot ahead, another three. And it's like, oh my gosh, we're down by five with 45 seconds left. Next thing you know, we're in overtime. Darren Williams hits another three. And it's like, we're up by six points, man. We did this thing. And even though you watch your team dominate all year long, there's nothing like the victory you see from them being in a situation of adversity where they're supposed to lose and they show the kind of greatness that can only emerge when you're behind, when you're behind the eight ball and you say, I'm not giving up. I'm, 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 I'm crawling back. I'm fighting back. I'm scratching my way back. I will win this game. And I feel like your life was like that game, you know, like the, the, the get into the million dollars by 30. That's huge, man. So much respect for being able to do that. But coming back from nearly a million points behind, that's that's even bigger, man. That's even bigger. Yeah. Most people will never hit that first achievement, but that that second one, mad respect for that, brother. Mad respect. <laughs> yeah, man. Well, man, yeah. look, we're, we're at time, man, but I, I got to have you back because I, I didn't get a chance to, to ask you so many things, and I have no regrets because everything that you shared was absolute gold. I'm sure Kamal feels the same way, but, but we got to get you back, man, sometime, and uh, maybe Most even true. get you to the studio. Uh, but I appreciate you joining us, brother. This is hot, man. Yeah, I appreciate you guys having me. It was a good conversation for sure. Blessings. Yeah. And, and send us a list of the, the ones that you uh, that you referenced, if you could, because yeah. I, I love to share okay. that with our viewers. Read it out, man. I, I got a lot of homework to do I'm because good. of you myself. Yeah. <laughs> respect. Come on. Respect, TK. <laughs> Absolutely, brother. All right, everybody. We'll be back Tuesdays. Uh, we'll be at Tuesday at 12 p.m. Eastern time. That's TK's two sets. And we'll see you next week, 12 p.m. Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Peace out, Rev. One Nation.